Hello, sorry that I'm somewhat late. Turns out that cabs here think that 35th is in another dimension or something. Try to get in a cab, they told me that they had no clue that that existed at all. Kick me out. Got another cab, they kicked me out as well. Um, it just seems that as soon as you mention Queen for some reason, they have like suddenly pregnant wives or stomach aches or anything. I don't know what happened. Um, either way, I got kicked out of a lot of cabs in New York this morning. Uh, but really glad to be here with all of you. Um, and today, I know the program says that my talk's going to be about certain things. Um, that was sent to Kevin because he asked me a month ago, what is your talk going to be about? And I didn't really know back then. Um, so I just gave like a good generic description of a talk that I would give. Um, instead, I want to talk a bit about um, the past three and a half years. I actually really like that he just mentioned that um, Hot Circuits, that exhibition here, was in 1988, because that's where our presentation is going to start. Um, I'm going to run you through my life, um, JW's life, Vlambeer, and all the ways that sort of ends up weirdly inter interconnecting. Um, for a lot of people, Vlambeer feels like a really old thing. Every time I ask people when was Vlambeer founded, they don't really know. Um, it's been three and a half years for us, um, which isn't that long. We were founded in 2010. It might have to do with the fact that our website generates a random number for the year every time you visit it. Um, we once had a journalist ask us what we did when we were founded in 1945, and we had to explain that right after the war, our grandparents started making board games. Um, when he asked whether that was really true, we had to admit that that wasn't true, which is sort of an awkward admission, I suppose. Um, my name is Rami. I'm one half of Dutch independent studio of Lambert. I do the business and development. Uh, the other half is JW, who doesn't like to travel all that much, so he's not here. Um, and the way this presentation is going to work is really simple. Uh, everything on the left side of the screen is about me. Everything on the right side is about JW. Everything that ends up doing that weird thing at the top is going to be about Flambeer. You'll figure it out. In 1988, I was born. October 30th, and this is the card that my um, parents had made for me. It is in the shape of a little pyramid, because uh, I'm half Egyptian. Um, was born in the Netherlands, though. And um, not much later, I, uh, I took my first steps, which is kind of cool. Um, they already had video game exhibitions in this museum when this happened. <laughs> That's sort of insane, right? So, a year after that, JW was born. That guy is young, by the way. Um, then the next day, he made his first video game. <laughs> That's not true. Um, he, he did become a gangster, like, a year later, though. Um, and then in, in another year later, I, uh, I was introduced to chess which was sort of the first game that I really played. I'm the, I'm the kid on the left. That's actually my childhood room. Um, I, uh, I was a really unruly, unruly um, kid back in uh, elementary school. Um, actually, I still am, but... Um, my teacher, instead of giving me uh, a lot of trouble for that, decided that a good idea would be to focus my energy on something else. And that something else turned out to be chess. Uh, he got this guy called uh, Pete. Um, to teach us um, chess and got a little team together. We actually started competing against other schools and sort of ended up being a little friendly competition, which was really nice. Um, and also it gave me f something to focus on. Uh, more interestingly, it was my first introduction to any game system at all. Then that same year, I, um, I found this... Uh, this board game it was a really old board game. I don't think anybody has ever heard of this uh, because everybody I ask about it has no idea what it is. It was a game in which you had to, um, you had like little rockets and you had to find like the right points to leave orbit. And then it was sort of, it was sort of a silly game. You just rolled dice and hope things worked out. Uh, but it was about space, which was super cool. Um, so not that much later, I wrote, um, I wrote this essay, which. Um, which says a bunch of really, really funny things. Uh, it says, um, in space there is no air, which I thought was really clever for a, for a five-year-old. Um, it says, in the future, people will also travel to other stars. Maybe people will live on Mars. But first, we have to invent space vehicles that can fly for years instead of days or weeks. And we have to research whether astronauts can stay that long in space. The first step to that is building a space station. 
sounds reasonable, right? Um, so I liked space. That was the thing I really liked. Um, and to build a space station, I needed something else. I needed a computer, uh, because that's how you build space stations. Um, and that computer was uh, literally this thing. This is the exact model. It's not the one we had, because I blew that up a few years later when I found a little switch on the backside that turned out to change the voltage on the computer. <laughs> I thought it would make it faster. It didn't work. Uh, but this computer was, was officially for my dad's work, right? Uh, we got it. I don't know how we got it, but it was for my dad's work. And sort of the idea was that, um, that it would have um, a, a graphical user interface where you could sort of tap around. It wasn't, it wasn't Windows. It was with, like, keys. Uh, but the engineer that, um, that installed the graphical user interface refused to turn off the DOS prompt, which was great because it let me to find this. Uh, this is a game called Gorillas. It's a game about two monkeys throwing explosives bananas at each other. Um, and the way it works is you type in an angle and a velocity and then the monkey throws the banana. Then the other player goes and you keep doing that until one of the arcs hits. Um, the thing is, this was in, Cuba in, in QBasic. And um, QBasic always had this, the source um, with the actual program. It was an interpreted language. So um, every time I wanted to play this game, I ended up staring at this code. So five-year-old me got curious and uh, decided to change a few words in the text of the menu, and suddenly my name was in the menu. For a five-year-old, the idea that you can type words and then change programs is more fascinating than building a spaceship, at least if you're me. Um, so that was it. I wanted, I wanted to program. And I started to program a whole bunch of stuff. Nothing good, but I started to program. JW, in the meanwhile, wanted to be an inventor. Um, he really wanted to build like 200 meter high combat robots. I don't know why that is, but that was actually what he was trying to do with his life. Um, space, space stations are way cooler. Um, JW ended up uh, skipping second class in 94. Uh, and a few years after JW, I have to admit, I was somewhat late. I became a gangster as well. Um, took a while. Um, anyway, my, my, um, my programming obsession took me through a lot of interactions, interactive fiction. Uh, I was inspired by a lot of it, and I ended up making a lot of it, because, hey, that was the one thing I could do if else statements are pretty easy. Um, so I figured those out, and suddenly I was making stories that you could interact with, which was cool. Um, I did have a bunch of failed career attempts. Um, this is me seconds before I kicked this ball about 12 meters over the goal. Um, when I showed my dad this photo, he started laughing uncontrollably. It's not quite good for your self-esteem. Um, and JW had a bunch of failed career attempts, uh, especially in math. <laughs> I don't think that ever worked out. Um, but he ended up playing chess as well. Um, there's something about chess, I guess. Um, and that was sort of his introduction to game systems. So it was about 95, and one of the things all the cool kids had was a PlayStation. So being, uh, being somewhat, um, somewhat spoiled, obviously, uh, I mean, I had a computer and I wanted to make video games, I asked my dad for a PlayStation. My dad, being the Egyptian he was, went to the black market and came back with this. <laughs> Which isn't quite a PlayStation. Uh, but it was kind of cool, because this is me and my brother in our Egyptian house um, playing Super Nintendo games on a thing that looked like a PlayStation, was named after a PlayStation, but mostly contained Prince of Persia. <laughs> Funny note about that, play, having 99 games on a single device to play gives you 99 games on a single device to play, even though the PlayStation would have given me one game that looked a lot prettier and would have made me a lot cooler with my friends. This one, allowed to play me, uh, this one allowed me to play a lot of games. Um, actually, it was 18 games, and then they repeated with like various glitches and level skips and stuff, but you know how that went. Um, and Egypt had something else that was cool. It had uh, arcades. Uh, this is actually my favorite arcade cabinet. If I can ever buy this in my life, I think I'll, I'll just be happy and just retire and do nothing for the rest of my life. Uh, it's called Panic Park, and the way it worked is it was a two-player game where each player had like 
a joystick. Um, and the, the position of the joystick translated to the position on the screen directly. So the thing was, you both wanted to be in the same place, and those joysticks actually moved in a rail, but they moved in the same rail. That's fun when you play against your younger brother, because he's not quite as strong as you, so you can just sort of like punch him out of it, which was, uh, which was great. Um, I won a lot of those games. I had a lot of fun with it. I don't know if I would win now. Um, he got a bit stronger, but you know I make video games, so I'm I'm smarter. <laughs> I think, I hope. Um, in 1994, four years later, JW starts reading, uh, which is quite a quite an interesting thing because he reads this magazine, which is called Compiquid. Um This is in the age of Just Jack Rabbit and SimCity, and uh, this this particular uh, issue of Compiquids had two pages about making video games. And one of those pages was about a Dutch tool made by this guy called Mark Overmars, who is a Dutch professor, and it was called Game Maker. So JW tried Game Maker, and he didn't understand a single word of it. So he gave up. That was 1999. Uh, in the meanwhile, I started getting involved in IRC and stuff like that. I, this is the only, the only IRC shot I could find that quickly. Um, and then a new millennium began. Uh, JW still didn't understand anything of Game Maker, but he was fascinated by the idea of making games, so he started writing really elaborate game design documents. Uh, I think at the top it says, Human, Monster, Orcs, Crazies, Dinos. <laughs> with the relevant weapons under each column. The dinos use grenade launchers. And Velociraptors. Both valid weapons. Um, the thing is, JW tried Game Maker again. Even though the first time he didn't really understand a word of it, um, he went back, he found this car tutorial um, where if you press the space bar, the car would honk. It would klaxon. So he changed that sound with the sound of a cow. So now every time he would press the button, the car would go Mrrr. That was good enough for him. Um, so he started making games and he started trying to make these elaborate whatevers into video games. Um, but he wasn't quite good enough, so he ended up joining this forum that sadly doesn't exist anymore, so we couldn't find any of his fun posts. Um, it's always fun to go back and read posts of like seven years old. It's highly embarrassing too. Um, he joined this community and released his very first game called Mage War. Um, we also couldn't find any images of that, so we have to trust JW that it was a really good RPG like. In the meanwhile, I wasn't quite doing video games anymore. I, uh, I liked breaking into my school network and um, downloading tests and printing them uh, before we had them. And then, you know, stuff like that. I had fun breaking things. That was what I did. Um, just to see what I could do. And that was sort of what, what these 10 years of my life were about. Like, how far can I push certain things? And um, how can I sort of screw the system, I guess? Uh, which is still sort of my thing, I guess. So that's cool. Um, but then in 2005, I found this thing, and that sort of triggered me back into going to video games instead of breaking things. Um, this is called Dark Basic. It is a basic language, much like the basic language that I first started out with. And I'd since sort of done different things, but I really wanted to make 3D games. And I wasn't, I wasn't capable of making 3D games. This tool promised that it would allow me to make 3D games. Uh, but if you look in the lower left corner, it says something called Rift Space. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and it's a space game. <laughs> space. That stuff, I like space. So um, I started searching for that game and eventually find the guy, found the guy that made it. And uh, he made space games. He did exactly everything that I wanted to do. Make video games, do stuff with space. So I sort of joined the forum, started talking, and sort of got involved in the project over time. Um, and that was sort of my, for my first real foray into actually making a real game, rather than things that fell apart um, as soon as you did something I didn't expect it. Um, technically still a game, I guess, but broken. Um, so this is where I started making games. This is the first moment where you can say Rami was making video games. Um, JW in the meanwhile joined the Poppencast, which was this uh, community of people that really liked Game Maker but did not like finishing games. 
they had a lot of game jams that took exactly three hours. That was sort of their thing. Uh, never really got them good in making big games, uh, but it did get them really good at design. Any process, any video game process is a process, a full process. If you start a game and then sort of work through it and sort of identify what you're doing and go through conceptualizing and actually making it, you're essentially going through all of those stages the same way you would if you took three, three weeks or three months or anything. Um, so the people that came from here are the people that would end up making Hotline Miami or, um, in our case, um, Lift Trousers or Nuclear Throne. Um, so for JW, even though he didn't really make anything good, he did make a lot of stuff. That's a really good way of getting better at making video games. And meanwhile, I had a weird thing where I started making space-related images. That was cool. I had this super big idea that I wanted to make, but didn't really work out. Um, that was my first. That was my first time leading a team. Turns out, leading a team is a bit harder than you think. Um, and then I ended up doing this thing where I would debate and pretend I was one of the countries of the United Nations. It's called a model United Nation. I ended up being Cuba, and I worked together with the United Kingdom to screw over the U.S. Sorry, guys. It was great. I had so much fun. Uh, this is me right before I screwed the U.S. like massively. It was such a good day. Um, this is why I still don't get into this country without trouble, I think. Um, JW in the meanwhile joined the indie gaming source uh, forums, um, working on Revenger Man, his new big project, will be a straightforward platform shooter about kicking enemies. That was his next big project, um, and he sort of, sort of started identifying himself under the the, the nickname Slordig.com, which means messy, or sloppy, whatever you want. Um, he started making games about shooting things, because. If you do a lot of three-hour game jams and you specialize in shooting things, you get really good at making games about shooting things. Um, I, in the meanwhile, decided to do something useful with my life and enrolled in two schools in the Netherlands. That would turn out to be a mistake later, um, but for now, uh, important to say, I did get accepted to both of them, and then bureaucracy sort of made it not happen. So I was not allowed to study for a year. So I was sort of disappointed because here I was, had the opportunity of my life to make video games at a school and actually not have to feel guilty about sitting behind a computer all day. Um, but I was not allowed to do that. So instead I started selling computers at the largest electronics um, store in the Netherlands. Um, in the meanwhile, I still did do the video game stuff. I was still working on the space games. Um, I started organizing little events. This was our equivalent of the National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo, which happens in November every year. Uh, we decided to do the same thing, but with video games. Um, and then in 2008, both me and JW decided to go to the Utrecht School of Art and Technology. The first year was great. Learned a lot. Um, a lot of things that we would not normally um, try uh, 3D, great. A um, lot of lot of interesting new perspectives, but um, we didn't really like it, so we started this own project on the site um, without permission of the school, which eventually ended up in them claiming the rights to our project and basically shutting it down. Um, JW made a game based on a game of somebody else in this uh, in this room, uh, which was the gutter, uh, based on the graveyard. Uh, this is about a drunk guy trying to stumble to the end of the street before he passes out to sleep on his cardboard box. Um, I think JW still insists that it was a parody of the graveyard, but I think he just didn't really understand what parody meant. Um, that's fine, though. It's fine. Uh, it was a fun game. Uh, if, you, if you paid $5, you could unlock a mode where you would always get hit by a truck in, at the intersection. Um, then it says something smart. I forgot what it said, but something about like the nature of life. Uh, I, in the meanwhile, have helped release this game, and this was sort of the first time I was involved in a really commercial game release. JW ended up going to GDC, um, where he... I think this is the first time he actually met Cactus, who would end up making Hotline Miami. Um, this is what they looked like. Yeah. Um, I, in the meanwhile, went to GDC Europe, and I don't have photos of that, so you can't laugh at me. Um, and then me and JW both decided that enough is enough. If they're going to take the rights of our game, if they're going to stop us from doing the stuff we want, we're going to drop out. Screw this. We don't, we don't want to be funneled into whatever they want. We've been making games since we were six. 
Do you know who we are? <laughs> We're done. Um, we might have been a bit rash, but hey, um, you make rash decisions. Uh, but we had one, one really good triumph card. Um, it was this. It's called Crates from Hell. Um, and this game was interesting. It wasn't quite good. Yeah, there were like a number of crates on the screen that you could collect and they would give you a weapon and points. And there was something there and we could both see it, but it looked awful and it sounded awful and that whole thing with the multiple crates didn't really work. Um, so we decided to make this game better and we came up with a plan. This is our plan. It is a bear on fire that is smiling. For those of you that ever wonder, Flambeer smiles. That's the thing that it does. Um, it literally means flaming bear, by the way, um, which sort of explains our logo. Um, everybody thinks it's a pig. It's a bear. Come on. Uh, <laughs> this is literally the drawing it was based on, so I can see how there is a misunderstanding. Um, we established a few short-term goals. We wanted to create Super Crate Box, but do it as a business card rather than a product. We wanted people to get to know us. We wanted to earn funding through making smaller games, and we set a goal to make better games, not bigger <coughs> games. And then, for the long term, we wanted to create a good workflow towards digital distribution. We wanted to make Flambeer a known presence in the Dutch or international independent gaming scene, and wanted to support and expand the Dutch scene if we could. This was the first time me and JW ever did anything serious with our lives, I think. So we thought, why not aim high? Um, so we started brainstorming on that, which looked a lot like drawing Super Crate Box Doodles. Um, there's a lot of really weird stuff here um, on this page, uh, but I don't think I have enough time. Um, it, in the top left it says keep fixing the flow and have it tested, which is pretty smart for two guys that just dropped out of school. Um, find planets, buy items, be surprised. I don't even know what that means. I don't think any of that made it to Super Crate Mox. Um, anyway, we had this game that was doing that was interesting, so we decided to show it at this event. They had a they had a spot, a, a single spot, so we showed it. It was still called Slordig back then because we hadn't actually started Flamber yet, but people liked the game. So we were like, you know what? We're doing it. We're dropping out. We're starting this company, Flamber. Boom. September first, two thousand and ten. Me and JW stopped with our education and started a company, which led to immediate success <laughs> and riches <laughs> in the form of noodles. Uh, these, are, these are great. Uh, you buy three meals for one dollar, um, and then you get one chicken, one duck, and one beef. Uh, the chicken and beef are awful. They taste like plastic, but the duck ones are actually pretty good. So if you find yourself ever in a situation where you're so poor that you can't afford food, find three friends, split these, you take the duck ones. <laughs> We needed money, because you can't eat this for months. Um, so we decided to do the one thing we're good at, make a game. What kind of game do you make when you're out of money, you just dropped out of school, you don't know what to do, you've heard that Flash Games is interesting? You make a game about shooting fish. Radical fishing. It was a game based on a documentary we watched about tuna overfishing, and there was this beautiful slow motion shot of a fish being flung up into the air, and we thought, duck hunt. So we made this game, and then we were in the games press. Suddenly Kotaku picked up on it. Me and JW spent about an hour screaming and giving each other high fives. Um, and then we started negotiating about the game, and somebody offered us $3,000 for the game. You can buy a lot of noodles for $3,000, but we thought that's not good enough. We can get more. So we said, OK, you know what? 3000 sounds great, but somebody else offered eight. Wasn't true, but hell, hell if they knew. Uh, so they said, we can offer nine. And we said, Ugh, you know, there's this other website. We don't really like them, but they offered 10,000. So if you, if you like pay anything above that, we'll, we'll give you the game. So we got this as a response. Um, <laughs> so we ended up selling Radical Fishing for exactly $10,001. I still have that contract printed in the office. It actually, after, after the number, they write out the value, right? So it says 10,001 US dollars which I think is great. Um, anyway, um, we made that game, and then at this event, this guy called Brandon Boyer came around, 
and he was sort of a big deal we heard so we showed him super crate box we're like dude you should you should play this game so i played super crate box for like 15 minutes he was like oh yeah this is cool they're like oh and we also made this you know fishing game it's kind of okay and then he didn't give us our laptop back for three and a half hours he really liked radical fishing um so he said you know what you should maybe do something with this so we said okay we can do something with this um but we don't know how to program that he was like i know this guy this guy's name's Zach Gage, he lives in New York. He can he can probably program this this radical phishing iOS. So you're like, okay, sure, sure. Uh, we'll talk to Zach, we'll figure this out. That's when we started. We started radical phishing iOS. Um, in the meanwhile, we were making a bunch of other games because we get really bored. This is Space Murder. Uh, this is the first game that established the rule at Vlambeer that any game we have with space in the title gets cancelled. Uh, we have Space Murder, we have Space Beaver, we have, s we have a bunch of other space games, all of them we started on, none of them we finished. Um, we cancelled that, and then it was time um, to release Crates from Hell, only by now it looked like Super Crate Box. Uh, it was released for free on October 22nd, um, it was going to be October 20th, because in Europe that would be 2010, 2010, which we thought was cool. But some other guys decided to release a game back then with nine letters in common. It was called Super Meat Boy, and uh, that was kind of confusing. So we decided to delay our launch by a few days. Um, but for us, this was really important. This was our business card. We were going to show the world that this is what we do. And it sort of worked out because we got nominated for the Independent Games Festival's awards, and we were getting flown out to San Francisco and fancy food. We didn't know that fancy food means you get a big plate with like a single bite of food. Uh, we thought we'd get a proper meal, but hey. Um, anyway, suddenly we were known, and suddenly people were following us on Twitter, and people were following us on Facebook, and it was all super exciting. Um, but we needed more money, because by the time we were done with Super Crate Box, we were out of money. So we decided to pitch. We pitched this game to Adult Swim, and we are really good at pitching. <laughs> Can you believe they paid 30000 for this? <laughs> Great. Um, that was also the first time we realized that if you're going to negotiate, you better make the other party angry, because um, we said 30,000 and they said okay. <laughs> That's sort of the worst outcome for a negotiation you could ever have. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were stuck making a dinosaur game, and uh, that was fine, I mean, we can, we can make a dinosaur game. Then these other guys from Texas, they decided to send us an email that started with gents, which I think is a pretty interesting intro. Um, and this guy is called Nigel, and he was working on a serious Sam game. And he wanted us to make a serious Sam game, but we didn't want to make a serious Sam game for him. Because we were pretty sure that this guy in a suit, he probably wanted Super Crate Box with a serious Sam skin. We're like, hell no, that's not going to happen. So we thought, you know what, we're going to pitch the absolute worst idea we can come up with. Because we were both Serious Sam fans, and we couldn't live with the idea that we would say no. Right? We didn't want to say no and just be like, ah, well, done. Um, so instead, we pitched the worst idea we could come up with, and that was a turn-based RPG. You can not get further away from Serious Sam. It's again, but running backwards, shooting things, explosions, we're going to be like, you pick things from a menu. So they said yes. Um, <laughs> so then we were also stuck making a Serious Sam game. Um, it is also sort of the first time the whole term indie publisher was a thing, which I think was interesting because this is 2010 and what these guys were doing was sort of unprecedented. People reaching out to indies making like spin-off games of a big AAA franchise. Um, we would continue to work with Devolver in the future, uh, but in the meanwhile we were also doing stuff in the Netherlands because we wanted to complete those goals we set at the beginning, so we wanted to strengthen the Dutch indie scene didn't really exist back then, so that wasn't that hard. We just decided to go to a bar, make a poster, and that was in the meetup. Um, so that was, that was us completing our first goal, January 13th, January 13th? 13th uh, 2010, we had our first, uh, 2011, we had our first indie meetup. Then right after that, we made a video game that died at the Global Game Jam. Uh, this is Glitch Hiker. It was a game with 100 lives. Every time somebody would play it, it would lose a life, and when the lives ran out, it was unplayable. Um, so I can't play this game, nobody can play this game, this game is dead. 
That was interesting for us. You can also do weird stuff with games. That's, that's kind of cool. Um, and suddenly people were asking us to speak at things, which we didn't really understand because, you know, we were school dropouts. Uh, so we did our first talk. We were pretty awkward. Uh, wow, that is really awkward. Uh, you, you should listen to this talk, by the way. It's in Dutch, but you will completely get that we had no idea where we were. Um, but yeah, we went to the IGF, and this is me holding a monetize that shit uh, thing upside down. We thought it was a fun joke, print 100 monetize that shit flyers and put them at the PayPal booth. Um, or that any of the companies monetizing things, because that was a big thing. Um, I think we actually also put a few at Sony's booth. Sorry, Nick. Um, and then from GDC, we launched this game about hunting yetis. Uh, because we'd seen this documentary about a guy who said he had seen a yeti. And the documentary treated him as crazy, and everybody sort of treated him as crazy, because the yeti doesn't really exist. So we're like, what if this guy's right? So we'd made it a game in which you have to hunt a yeti, but the yeti doesn't exist. <laughs> and it took people like five or six hours to figure out the joke. Uh, and then a few hours after people figured out the joke, somebody did find the yeti. Because we had programmed it in such a way that there is a Yeti, it's just really, really rare. So when that person uh, posted a screenshot of the Yeti, nobody believed him. <laughs> we launched this from the GDC show floor, uh, because why the hell not? Um, and then we also made this game called Karate, which is about punching people to the gods in heaven with your fists. Which is what we assumed karate meant. Uh, it later turned out we were wrong, and also that you're allowed to kick in karate. Um, so that was, that was interesting. One thing that we noticed, though, is that this game got a lot of press attention, and we don't know why. Um, so we started looking, and we figured out that just the entire middle part of the games industry was suddenly gone. It was there a year ago, but now it was just gone. All these middle-sized budget companies had suddenly disappeared. Uh, so we did this talk, in, uh, <laughs> and we did this talk at this event where there were 200, like 200 middle-sized company CEOs. And we told them that they were dying and they were going to be out of the games industry in a year. Um, and then a lot of them were like, do you have numbers for that? And we were like, no, we have a gut feeling. And that's about it. Um, a year later, we got a lot of emails, but you were right, by the way. Um, so yeah, the whole entire middle part of the industry just sort of disappeared. And the indies started to fill that space with little games about punching people to heaven with their fists. We released Dinosaur Zookeeper on June 16th of 2011, and then we got a bit bored, so we made this game about shooting airplanes. It started to be sort of a theme. JW's love for shooting things was definitely a big part of Flamber's DNA. Um, we tried to sell this to sponsors like we'd done Dinosaur Zookeeper, but they deemed the game too extreme. That's a literal quote. That is not me making this up. A company literally sent us an email that this game was too extreme for their portal. So we added in some analytics, which was fun, uh, because over the years, uh, over the months after we released Lufthrauser, we found out that Lufthrauser, without any marketing, was getting more plays than Dinosaur Zookeeper, which had all of Cartoon Network behind it and cost $30,000. So we sent them an email to, you know, point out that they might want to reconsider the person that's choosing their games. Um, and this is also the first time I worked with Yukio. But for us, this was super valuable because suddenly we could prove that we had games that people wanted to play. We had numbers. Um, and we would, we would keep that trick for the rest of our time as Flambeer. Um, and then this Brandon Boyer guy showed up again. He keeps doing that. He's sort of like in the story, out the story, in the story. Yeah, he was launching this website called uh, Venus Patrol. And we thought, you know what? We're going to make a top-down roguelike with Gangster Rap. So that was called Gun Guns. Um, and this is sort of like the first point where the financial part of Flamber becomes interesting for me. Um, this, is, this is sort of what our earnings look like. The first part is the noodles. And then we made some money. And then we made some more money. And the idea was that we would ask for small payments every time. We would build our company on this idea of incremental revenue. Every time we make a game, we start earning a bit more. And we just keep doing and doing that until we have 200 games and we're earning a shit ton of money. Um, which was great. Everything was going well. This line is going up, which is generally considered good in economics. Um, and we were happy. We were working 20 hours a day. But hey, um, this was cool. Um, and then that's the end of chapter one, because that's where 
um, Game Knots decided to rip off Radical Fishing. That was a disappointing moment. Um, we had to super quickly announce Ridiculous Fishing because, hey, these guys were cloning our game. Nobody knew that we were working on this game, so we should probably tell people that they are stealing our game. Um, so we spent like 40 hours at our office trying to deal with all of this. Um, that wasn't great. That was not great. Uh, that was pretty depressing. Um, and that is right before our first birthday. This is Flamber turning one. Uh, there were like 20 people. They gave us little presents like um, teddy bears with gasoline and lighters, <laughs> um, which were not allowed in the building. Um, and um, we, we released that Serious Sam turn-based RPG thing, um, but we almost, we almost like burned out doing that. Um, at this point, my job was full-time dealing with the Ridiculous Fishing clone, doing interviews, giving talks. Um, and JW was the only person working on this game. Um, it is probably not our most stable game, I would have to admit. It is our first title on Steam, which is kind of a big deal, but it was with Devolver's help. Um, this game taught us that we probably should look after ourselves. Um, and it wasn't going well with Flambeer. Uh We were running out of money. Um, even though Serious Sam earned us some money, um, the, the whole thing of us not making games at all was sort of sort of cutting into our bottom line. Um, we weren't earning anything except for this, um, and we almost went we almost went out of business. Um, and it was only because a few months before, when Ridiculous Fishing got cloned, that we decided that we should stop that from happening with Super Crate Box. That we reached out to Halfbot in Canada, who helped us port Super Crate Box to iOS. When that game released, we suddenly had some money again. And you can see that here. Um, that point at December 11 uh, um, is $2,000 on our bank account, um, which is absolutely nothing at that point. Uh, we were completely dependent on what we earned with Flambeer. And if it hadn't been for Super Great Box, we, uh, we would have been un under zero. And without any... Um, any financial support, that would have been it. So we decided to focus on our next, next big thing, which we called Hyper Crate Box. So that Gongoth thing was the last project we had from before Ridiculous Fishing got cloned. Uh, it had changed from a top-down roguelike to a first-person shooter, because it turned out we are not really good at top-down roguelikes. Um, and this is sort of the last game we, uh, we finished that we started before Ridiculous Fishing. Uh, we got introduced to a rapper who was really cool, those one. Um, we beat it, the rap in the game, and we have a game with gangster rap that's sort of cool. It's it's the only it's the second best game with gangster rap. Fifty Cent Blood in the Sand. <laughs> that game's good. Um, then Ridiculous Fishing got nominated for an IGF, which was great because that was sort of like you know a little kick that we really needed. Uh, so I went to IGF. We sort of got some motivation again. Um, and I started thinking, you know, all these, all these indies are making great games, but they're not really getting attention. So is there a way we can fix that? So I started working on this thing called Prescott, which um, Phil Tupatowski of Young Horses then convinced me to release in public. One of the interesting things that happened here is, even though I originally made this for myself, I ended up making it for everybody. And in trying to make, to make it for everybody, I ended up talking to a lot of press and figuring out the way they work and what they want and what they need of a game. Um, so suddenly I had this amazing treasure trove of information on press. Um, JW organized the game jam called 7 Day FPS. That ended up yielding a whole bunch of cool games. I think Receiver was made during 7 Day FPS and Super Hot was made during 7 Day FPS. And we had money, but uh, this is where Flamber almost falls apart. So we'd been, we'd been working on Hyper Crate Box trying to earn money trying to get this big project going for almost eight months now, and we weren't getting anywhere. And it just, it wasn't working. Things weren't working. And that was weird, because me and JW found ourselves at one of the indie meetups that we organize, sitting on the pool table, which is not allowed, by the way, but <laughs> fuck the popo. Um, we, um, we were talking about quitting. 
we were talking about being done with this because we weren't going anywhere anyway. Um, so we decided to do one more try. And uh, we did a course correction. We said, you know what? We started, we started Flying Beer because we wanted to make video games, not we wanted, because we wanted to get a really big budget and then make a video game. We said we'd make better games, not bigger games. So we made a small course correction. We released Space Murder, and we immediately announced Luft Trousers. And then worked on a gazillion prototypes. This are the letters F, B, R, S, and T. The rest is like up there and underneath there. Um, and this is where we, um, we, we ran into that, uh, this guy called Ted back then, and Ted worked at Sony. And Ted wanted us to do something with them. So Ted introduced us to another guy called Alessandro. And they were working on this thing called PlayStation Suite, which is probably the worst name for anything in history ever. Um, but they, wanted, they really wanted Super Crate Box. And this sort of started a trend that every new platform for indies has to start with Super Crate Box. I don't know what that is, but we had Super Crate Box. Um, we had Super Crate Box on a whole bunch of things, actually. Um, we met this bus driver who said he could also code. So we hired him um, to do the game. And then he made Super Crate Box in a day, which was great, because now we're done. Um, so we sent it to them. They happily renamed it PlayStation Mobile, which is still not great, but better than sweet. Um, but it was cool. We suddenly had a game on a thing that my mom would recognize by name. My mom doesn't really care all that much about videos. She's been listening. It's cool. My mom's cool. She listens. If I say, you know, Phil is working on this, she says Fish or Tipitoski. It's like, that's cool. Um, and I started blogging because I suddenly had opinions. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a blog. I'm going to talk about things, I think. Um, we released Super Crate Box on Steam. It took us a year and a half to negotiate that because we really wanted to release it as free, and Steam wasn't that happy with us just being like, hey, you know what, we'll use your service and your distribution method, and you'll get nothing. Um, so that took us a while, but it released on August 29th. Uh, but this was important. This was our first game on Steam. Without anybody's help, suddenly we were allowed to release games on Steam. Um, and since the thing with Sony worked out, a Super Crate Box on, on Vito was coming along nicely, we met this guy who literally throws money at games. Wait for it. <laughs> I love this guy. The, the, funny, the, the thing that the animation doesn't show is that the next thing he does is he picks up the money again. <laughs> which I think is sort of wonderful. I love this guy. Uh, his name is Shahid, um, and he works at Sony. And he asked us to, to maybe do lift trousers for a console. So we said, sure, we'll do it. Um, and in the meanwhile, we were still working on ridiculous fishing because that wasn't coming along. So me, Zach, and Greg decided to do the smartest thing when you're in a dip, which is take a car and drive from Seattle to New York through Nebraska, which is essentially a cornfield for six hours on both sides. Um, so. We were either going to hate each other or murder each other in that car, or we were going to get to New York and work on the game. It became the second thing, but it didn't really bring us anywhere. We made a bit of progress, but not enough. Um, so that project was still stand uh, st standing still. We released Super Crate Box Vita. Um, this was in like October, October 2012. And then I met the people that organized the Indie Mega Booth, uh, which was cool. Uh, I decided to ask if I could help out, and I did that for a few mega boots. Um, then I organized a game jam called Fuck This Jam, which was about making a game in a genre you hate, because I thought that would be a great idea. We got a lot of Candy Crush games, which would now be completely illegal, by the way. Don't do that. Um, and then in 2013, JW jammed on this prototype called Wasteland Kings from Mojam. Um, and that was sort of a cool game. Um, this is also when Ridiculous Fishing suddenly started moving again. Um, so we released Ridiculous Fishing, and then this happened. That, that, bottom, that line there is the, the bottom line is still the most money we ever had in the first few months. And that thing there is Ridiculous Fishing, and then we didn't have to worry about money for a while. Uh, ridiculous Fishing did really, really well for us. Um, at PAX East, we met this guy from Microsoft who was cool. Um, he said he would introduce us to his boss, so we said, sure. 
Um, GDC was different this year because suddenly we had cameras following us and people wanted to make documentaries and I had to carry a Sharpie around because people were asking for autographs, which is sort of madness. Um, we met this guy, John, from Twitch, who was also cool. I traveled so much that I had to start a website that tells people where I am. Um, it is isramiinthenetherlands.com. It will tell you exactly where I am. It's great. Um, and I started talking at more events. So I started doing a lot, a lot of talks. Um, Wasteland Kings, in the meanwhile, was introduced at Gamescom uh, on the Sony stage. Um, and that got the attention of some guy named Brian Fargo, uh, who happens to work on a game called Wasteland. So he sent us a polite email if he would please change the name or else. Uh, he didn't actually say or else. He just said, please change the name. Um, so we said, sure, we'll rename it Nuclear Throne. Um, and we'll just make it a nice story, you know? You can work together. You don't have to go all scrolls over everything. Um, and then we released Nuclear Throne and Early Access on October 11, 2013. Now, really quick overview of everything that happened up to now. This is our money. These are our Twitter followers. And this is the amount of game releases. We're at 18 right now. That's sort of where we are right now. Now, the reason I tell this story with everything in there is because if you look back, there are a lot of really, really obvious sort of relationships there, right? The only reason I knew how to negotiate is because I'd been a computer salesman, which is sort of weird if you think about it. But that's where I learned to, you know, sort of read people and figure out like, hey, how much do you want to offer? How much can we do? Can we maybe go for this more expensive model that will definitely help you in your life? Um, and the, the, the reason I had any uh, talking skills at all, the reason I could get on a stage and just sort of do a speech like this was because I'd done a lot of debate in the United, uh, in the United Nations, the fake model United Nations. Um, the reason JW was good at action games is because out of all the possible things that he could have done to make video games, he ended up on this forum of people that made games in three hours. Now, the thing we learned looking back is sort of that there is no real way of telling what will work and what will be beneficial. Um, the short version is there are really no shortcuts to making video games. You just have to do. You just keep going. Some things work, some things don't. And there really is no right way of making video games. Nobody knows what, what they're doing. And I'm not trying to say that nobody has any idea what they're doing. I'm trying to say that nobody knows what is going to work out. Anybody that tells you this is a guaranteed method of getting somewhere is lying, and you should probably ignore them. Um, because in reality, the best you can do is be informed, make informed decisions. And then that information could be wrong, or that information could be outdated by the time you're actually acting. Uh, on it. Um, and especially today, when there is more possibility for everybody to create, and everybody can make, essentially everybody could go and sit down and make a game about any subject, um, there really is no way to say what is right or wrong. So, to summarize, because there's people like flashing red lights at me that I need to wrap this up. Uh, every little thing you make helps you make better games. Everybody you talk to will help you make better games. Every event you visit will help you make better games. So make games. Thank you. How many seconds do I have for QA? Anybody, any questions? I can't actually see what anybody. You have a question. OK, go. I mean, the, the one thing that I would like to absolutely point out is that if you, if you want to use a lot of dedication to do what we're doing, that's sort of not a good idea because we're already doing that. Uh, you should do your own thing. Um, but yes, I think that if you have a lot of dedication, you can eventually end up somewhere. There's always the factor of luck. Nobody can ever say that luck is not involved. But I think the problem with the word luck is that it means two separate things. You have the type of luck that means you sit in your bedroom coding without ever getting in touch with anybody and suddenly somebody like i don't know somebody jumps out of a helicopter through your window sees your game calls the press and you become rich uh that is luck the, the other luck is you go to every event 
you can go to, you meet every person that you can, and then you increase your chances for opportunity in such a way that you end up getting lucky. Those two things are separate things. They, we use the same word for them, which is hopelessly confusing. Um, but I think with the right amount of dedication and hard work and continuously asking yourself why you're doing what you're doing and how you could do things better, everybody can sort of do something that is interesting for themselves. Please don't do what we're doing. We're, we're a terrible role model. I mean, we made a bunch of 3D games. Oh. So would we, would we do 3D games at some point? Uh, we've actually done a 3D game, right? Gun Gods is 3D. It's not really something we, we want to go after all that much. One of, one of the, one of the, I mean, when, when you look at the Flambeer website, our, our sort of slogan is bringing back arcades since a randomly generated year. Um, we, we believe that there's a lot to explore in arcade, uh, even though a lot of people claim that this sort of that part of gaming is dead now. There, uh, everything we did in the first year or a half of Flamber are games that could have been made in the 80s. We actually made Super Crate Box for Commodore 64 to prove that it could have been made a long, long time ago. Um, it, they're just ideas that nobody ever came up with. And that is sort of what we want to do, is figure out those game ideas that could have existed but don't. And there are a lot of people doing really interesting things at any part of gaming. There are people doing really cool things in narrative. There are people doing really cool things in, in games with um, over-the-top explosions and, and not as great screen shake as we have, but pretty good screen shake. Um, that's not our, f that's not our, our battle, I think. We want to we wanna show people that there is more to explore in arcade games. That's sort of where we're at. Can I have one more? No? One, one more. You, back. Yeah. Uh, we, we did that in English because we believe video games are an international medium and if we want to get feedback, we want to be able to show everybody we can. Good. This is not a good slide to end at. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's get a good one. Wait, wait, wait. I know how to do this. Thank <laughs> you.